Well, welcome again, everybody. Uh, this is session two of our uh, class of, of uh, Becoming or Building an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer. And this session is called Explaining Eternal Purpose Prayer. Uh, last session just talked about the summons to the golden altar and the, the urgency and the burden that we have that the Lord has for us as forerunners uh, to begin to pray that way. And now in this session, we want to kind of begin to expand upon what it means. Uh, uh, in session three and four, five and six, we'll go into different prayer themes that are focused on uh, in, a, in an eternal purpose house of prayer. Uh, but this one, I just kind of want to kind of define it, what eternal purpose prayer is, uh, and expand upon that definition as well as uh, kind of tie it in a little bit more to God's eternal purpose. So that's what our goal is in this session. Uh, you know, one thought that is, comes to me regularly related to praying into God's eternal purposes is that, you know, we have to have understanding uh, language and understanding in our heart of what uh, the God's eternal purpose is and also we have to have an environment in our own heart where, where we are pursuing these things or if we're a pastor of a church where we're leading our churches to pursue these things uh, and out of that will flow prayer into God's eternal purposes. So it's really important that we have a depth of understanding into God's eternal purpose in order to build an eternal purpose house of prayer. Um, you know, for those that are taking the Forerunner School, you probably just finished uh, the Eternal Blueprint class, which goes into a lot of, I mean, the whole class is focused on God's eternal purpose. And so that's helpful, very helpful to understand how to pray. Uh, and so we'll talk more about that in this session, and uh, and then we'll go into some of the themes that p pertain to that. Uh, but it's very important that we have understanding of what all these things are, and it, it'll grow. I mean, if you're just being introduced to eternal purpose and the different issues, the bride being made ready and, and the corporate man coming forth and all those kinds of things, it may be overwhelming, but it, it'll come to you if you'll just kind of persevere and dig uh, in uh, to this. So um, uh, anyway, that's what we want to talk about in this session is we want to really explain uh, and define God's eternal purpose prayer. So let's pray. Father, we once again thank you for this day, for this session, uh, and for those that are participating in this class. Let the spirit of wisdom and revelation rest upon us. We ask that we would walk in a manner worthy of you to please you in every respect. And that you, once again, I, I confess that I am merely an earthen vessel. You are the treasure. And I ask that you, as a treasure, speak valuable words, gems, and nuggets of a great value to those who will be a part of this, listening to this and studying this session. So I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, again, this is session two of uh, the uh, House of Prayer class, uh, Eternal Purpose House of Cla Prayer, and it's explaining uh, God's eternal purpose. Explaining eternal purpose prayer, not explaining God's per eternal purpose. Okay, let's, let's do a little bit of review um, uh, about God's eternal purpose. Uh, in, the class, in, the, in the class we had, the Eternal Blueprint, uh, Brian listed five major aspects. These are big picture aspects. Five major aspects of God's eternal purpose. And I would really challenge you to learn these where you, you just be able to recite these on your own. Now, not necessarily word for word, but in your own words, recite these five things because this is really uh, an important dynamic in terms of understanding how to pray into God's eternal purpose. And so, but let's just kind of review these five um, aspects. The first one uh, is that Christ, Jesus Christ, is and forever will be at the center of everything. Before the foundation of the world, the Heavenly Father established that His eternal purpose would revolve around the eternal Son, Christ. 
His eternal plan is and forever will be to bring all of creation under the headship of the eternal Son. God's ultimate intention, predetermined before creation, is for Christ to be at the center, to have preeminence in everything, and to bring the entire universe under his headship. Now, I won't, I'm not going to read all five of them in title, but that one is important, so important, the most important one. Everything is about elevating and exalting the eternal man, Christ Jesus, the eternal son. Uh, let me just read a couple of passages of scripture. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. Colossians 1, 18. He is also, talking about Christ, he is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning of, the firstborn from the dead. Now, when that, he says that, I want you to make sure you understand it. He's not saying that Christ was born. Christ is eternal. He was there forever and, and part of the eternal council of eternal Godhead. Eternal there. That's primogenitor, what they're talking about. He's the firstborn. Firstborn rights of the, uh, of the family. He has the, the privilege and the rights. The firstborn uh, uh, from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. In other words, he is preeminent. He is central. He is the first first fruits of the resurrection. He is all of those things. He is, it's, it's all about him. He is preeminent. He is central to everything. Eternal purpose is about Christ, about the man, Christ Jesus. Now, for also Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Now this verse 10 is really key. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and, uh, and which are on earth in him. And so eternal purpose is to exalt the man Christ Jesus, to make him preeminent, central to all things, and for ever and ever and ever to join heaven and earth in, uh, in, in God's creation with Christ, with him as the head, with Christ as the head. That's the first premise of, of God's eternal purpose. The second one uh, is that for the father to have a family of Christ-like sons. Um, now, what he wants, and this is a, a key in purpose, all of creation is working toward these, uh, uh, all of time is working towards these goals, toward a family of sons, mature sons, for the heavenly father. We see this, and we'll look at it in a minute, uh, Revelation chapter 12, we see the culmination of that in the man-child. But it's a corporate son, a corporate man uh, uh, for uh, mature sons for the father. That's the second one. The third aspect of God's eternal purpose is for the eternal son to have an equally yoked bride. Uh, the, in the eternal council of the Godhead, that it was determined that Christ would have out of his creation an equally yoked bride. Uh, and so that's, again, part of the eternal purpose and plan is to, to have a, a group of people, same people, that will become mature sons for their father and an equally yoked bride for Christ. And the fourth aspect is um, somewhat similar, is for the Holy Spirit to have a people in whom to dwell. Uh, and so before time in creation, and there's, I won't read all of that, but the Lord's ultimate intention is to have a people who become a corporate dwelling place of the Spirit. God's aim is for a corporate expression of Christ's indwelling life to become a mature man, which Paul said is the measure and the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So that's the fourth aspect. And then the fifth aspect uh, of God's eternal purpose is for believers who are invited to receive an inheritance of eternal intimacy with the Godhead, eternal authority 
forever to be used in partnership with the Godhead uh, and eternal glory uh, to, for eternal rewards. And so, you know, we see that the, the eternal purpose of, of the church age uh, is, to, is focused on seeing these five things come forth to exalt in, preemin in the preeminence of Christ, uh, to work on preparing a corporate man who, who Christ dwells in in fullness uh, as a, with the temple of the Holy Spirit, and for an e also an equally low bride, and to prepare the church, to prepare the, the, the God's people to be used forever and ever and ever in an intimacy, authority, and glory with the Godhead as the cre as God's plan is expanded throughout, the, throughout eternity. You know, Isaiah 9-7 uh, uh, talks about this, that the government of, will be upon Christ and it will always be increasing um, forever, forever. And I have no idea what that means. I mean, we do have a glimpse of it in the age to come as the earth is transformed under the authority and dominion of Christ and his people will be used in various degrees of authority and glory in that, in intimacy, in terms of dwelling in the new Jerusalem with Christ. So there's a lot of, th we have a few tidbits, but it goes on forever and ever and ever. There are multiple, infinite, I guess, ages uh, to come, and, uh, and the church age is for these things to be uh, fulfilled. And so when we start talking about praying into these things, we need to understand these things need to be in our heart. They need to be deep in our heart that this is what God has, this is why I live, this is why I exist, is to do this. And so we can pray with authority and understanding for the bride to be made ready. We understand what is involved in those things so that we can make, uh, so that we can pray with depth of understanding on those things. So we need to understand God's eternal purpose if we're going to be uh, effective in praying into the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. So anyway, I challenge you to really make sure you understand these things. I know in that class there was a lot of detail, and maybe you can't remember it all for sure, but you, you can capture these uh, big-picture nuggets so that you'll know how to pray with, with effectiveness, effectiveness. Now, uh, I want to, before we uh, define it, I want to go now into uh, another aspect of this, and that's uh, cre uh, creating or a, a spiritual environment devoted to God's eternal purpose. This comes from our uh, life school class, uh, the Eternal Purpose Church, and uh, primarily we'll use this material with pastors in, in Africa and wherever we're working with pastors uh, as a master builder to, to help them build a different kind of church, a new wineskin of a church. Because, you know, one of the things you'll see uh, in uh, a lot of churches, but in, in, so this is certainly predominant in Africa, there's kind of like the man of God syndrome and what they're uh, what's focused on is things like getting your healing, getting your deliverance, getting uh, a prophecy, you know, prosperity, and things along those lines, rather than the things that are connected to God's eternal purpose. And so, for pastors, and, but this will apply also to uh, individuals as well, and that whether you're a pastor or not. For, but for, I'll use the example of pastors. For pastors, you need a whole different spiritual environment in your church. Your messages need to be different. Uh, the way you structure your church, it needs to be different. The worship needs to be different. All of it needs uh, to be different to exalt the man Christ and to be focused on preparing the bride and the, and the corporate man and all the different uh, things there. So I've come up with 10 things and I'm, I'm going to go through them really, really quickly. Um, uh, but it, out of this environment that's focused on building these five uh, aspects of eternal purpose, you can create an, a, an atmosphere where you and others can pray uh, into God's eternal purpose very effectively. So the first environment, area of spiritual environment, and by far the most important is create an environment in your heart, your life, your church, uh, 
where Christ is central and preeminent uh, in God's eternal, eternal pr purpose, Christ is to be the supremely exalted and central to all he does, more so than things of God, more so than the things like prophecy and uh, healing and provision and the gifts of the Spirit. Now, all those, we believe in all those, and they're all important. I'm not minimizing the need for those things, but the objective is to exalt the man Christ in our life. And so that's the environment that we need to, to live in. The second one uh, is for, to create an environment for the bride to be made ready. Uh, if you're a church, you need, if you're a pastor, you need to create an atmosphere where the people understand the expectations of the New Testament related to the bride being made ready. If you're an individual, you need to be on that journey of the bride being made uh, ready. You need to have understanding of those things. It needs to be part of your spiritual environment in your own heart uh, is to, that I'm on a journey. I'm a betrothed bride to Christ and I'm on a journey to be made ready, to make myself ready by, by empowered by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. See, so those kind of things have to be in there and so that you can pray. And out of, you know, when all this is happening, then prayer for this will be uh, just overflow of your life. That's the point I'm trying to get uh, to with all this. And so the third one uh, is to have an, an, an environment where you can grow in intimacy and union with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, intimacy with Christ uh, is so important. In intimacy, fellowship with the Holy Spirit is so in important if you're going to be effective at praying into God's eternal purpose. Of course, it's important for every aspect of your uh, walk with the Lord as well. Now, you know, each one of these we could take uh, a whole class on, really, but I'm just kind of touching on them right now. The fourth area uh, is for overcoming sons to be raised up. Uh, again, similar to the bride, but overcoming sons to be raised up. Where that is a something that's going on in your heart that I need to be a, become an overcomer. I am in Christ is overcome, and I'm in Him. But I need to be uh, made ready as an overcomer as well. Um, the fifth area is to take on the nature and character of Christ in fullness, to be conformed into His image. Uh, so, because it's the Christ where uh, it's the image of Christ in fullness that makes us ready as a bride and an overcoming son. The sixth area of spiritual environment uh, is to intercede before the heavenly golden altar. Now, that that uh, is something that is the purpose of this class. So I'll skip on over that. The seventh area uh, is for people to be equipped to understand. The end times, because if we're going to pray into God's eternal purpose, the end time prayer, especially as we, excuse me, as we get into some of these themes, you know, we're pray, we're talking about raising up the corporate man, but we're also going to be talking about resisting those things that come against us, and end time issues become very intricately involved, and so we have to have an understanding that we're living in the end times. Uh, otherwise, if we don't have an understanding that we're living in the end times and believing that Christ could come back even in our lifetime, uh, that uh, and understanding some of the dynamics of what's involved, that will not be as effective and won't have the burden to pray into God's eternal purposes. So that's a, another one. Uh, let's see where, okay. The eighth one is uh, an accurate vision of the judgment seat of Christ. This is so important to have an accurate understanding, to realize that we and others are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our lives. And uh, but that when we do this, that will determine uh, eternal rewards into what level and what participation, what level of intimacy and what level of participation we'll have for all of eternity. Uh, because that will affect the way we pray. Now, all of these affect a lot of other issues other than just prayer, but I want to focus just on uh, prayer uh, today. Uh, uh, the ninth one is for a mighty army, end-time army to arise. See, we are participators and not spectators in end-time events. God wants an army, army of intercessors, an army of messengers, an army of master builders, 
an army of witnesses, an army of evangelists. He wants an army uh, to confront and to stand and to build in these last days. And so that's important uh, as well. And then the 10th one, and some of these are more important than others as it relates to prayer, but I want to just go through all of these. Is to be faithful. The 10th one is to be faithful witnesses of truth. Faithful witnesses of truth. Uh, we need to be a, a, a place uh, where truth uh, is being communicated, uh, whether it's a church or whether it's our own life. Or whatever. Uh, prayer is crucial to these things being raised up, these 10 issues, but it's also crucial that the environment of these things be in place in order for prayer to be raised up. Kind of a complicated statement, but it works both ways uh, there. And so if we're going to be effective as an eternal purpose house of prayer, we have to understand God's eternal purpose. We have to be able to communicate it uh, in our own words. We don't have to be able to write a book uh, called The Eternal Blueprint about it, but we do need to understand it and have some guideline, guide, guidance into it and the environment that we're in our own heart, life, and church where we're pursuing it. Those things are critical if we're going to be effective at becoming an eternal purpose or building an eternal purpose house of prayer, uh, the more we can get this into our heart and get it into our life uh, and get it into our language, into our speech, the more effective we'll be in praying into God's eternal purposes. Now, I'm not talking about being a robot where you just uh, by rote repeat all these things, but the more this is... You're, more you're living these issues, the more prayer just flows naturally uh, out of you into these various topics. So that was the, the first point in explaining uh, God's eternal purpose. Now I want to begin to define uh, God's eternal purpose. Um, here's our definition. This is the definition that I've come up with, and you can maybe come up with something a little different, but I think it communicates pretty effectively what God's eternal purpose prayer is. Not, not, this is not a definition of God's eternal purpose. It's a definition of God's eternal, of eternal purpose prayer. Uh, so anyway, here it is. Uh, eternal purpose prayer is prayer which focuses on the eternal purposes of God, those things, those five things, and the spiritual environment that we talked about. But basically those five issues of eternal purpose from the eternal blueprint. It's prayer that is focuses on these issues and not, this is part of the definition again, not on the needs or the desires of man and originates from a heavenly perspective. That's it. So let me just read it all here at once. Eternal purpose prayer is prayer, and this is in the notes. You don't have to worry about copying it down right now. Eternal purpose prayer is prayer which focuses on the eternal purposes of God, not on the needs or desires of man, and it originates from a heavenly perspective. Uh, so th this is the definition. So we want to kind of begin to explain it a little bit and tie in some key points here related to that definition. But it's not to be random. Eternal purpose prayer is not to be random. It's not to be focused on uh, personal needs or, or our own nation's national, na national interests. Rather, it's, about, it's according to the very precise plan, uh, God's eternal purpose. Not to be focused on our church needs and all that, but on God's eternal purpose purpose. And you think, well, that won't take long to pray. Well, it, there are a million different things you can pray into this, but it's based on God's eternal purpose being fulfilled. So the question comes up, and this question came up with us, is can I still pray for my own prayer needs? Uh, my own needs. Like, I, can I have to change the way I pray? Because what happened at our church uh, in the last session that we talked about the summons to the golden altar? And the question that came up from a number of people in our church was, well, okay, have I been praying wrong all of my life? Can I keep praying uh, uh, the way I've been praying? Can I pray for 
uh, you know, my family and my needs and all that. And, and so, you know, it took me a while to answer that. I mean, I, I, I said, yes, you can, but then I wasn't sure. So I went back and did, you know, a fair amount of research through the scriptures. And here's some of the things that uh, I, I came up with. Um, and this is in your notes, page 5.2c. Uh, uh, we all desire health, comfort, peace, pleasure, and provision. We all want purpose in our life and to fulfill our God-given destiny. In other words, every believer desires physical, material, and spiritual blessings in their life. This is normal and good. God is a good God who desires the best for us. Uh, even when he leads us into hard times, his best for us is in his heart. Remember, the scriptures tell us to pray the Lord's Prayer for God's will in our lives the meeting of our daily needs for forgiveness of sin and not to be led into temptation. Uh, the Bible also calls on us to pray for healing, James 5, and all the scripture verses for all these. Deliverance, you pray for deliverance, uh, help for help in times of need, and for our own personal needs to be met. In addition to these topics for prayer, we know through the scriptures that Paul prayed for the thorn in his flesh to be removed. Jesus prayed, asking the Father to remove the cup from the cross from him if it were possible. Uh, God, so God wants good things for us, and the scriptures tell us to pray for these things, for good, these good things. So the answer to the question is, can we still pray for our own needs? Yeah, absolutely we can pray for our own needs. Um, but there's another dynamic, another dimension, a higher way uh, to pray into God's eternal purpose. Um, now, that's not to not pray those things, but, you know, there is a scripture verse in Matthew 6.33, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Well, you know, a lot of it, as we pray for God's purposes, then a lot of these things kind of flow into our lives without having to pray and war for them. Although, uh, I do want to make it very clear this is where I am in my own life, is that my wife and I, we pray together pretty much every day, and we pray for uh, our day and for uh, whatever the needs are in our life. Uh, we pray for our kids and our grandkids, the church, and all the different uh, issues that are faced. So we do pray for those personal family needs on a regular basis, but also especially when we gather together in a corporate setting, we pray into God's eternal purposes. So both are important, but like I said in the last session, we cannot just patch eternal purpose prayer uh, into uh, uh, just a, a moment or two of our regular prayer life. It needs to be an important aspect of that. Uh, uh, so I'm trying to find where I am here on my notes. Um, okay, so... Let's, we're in Roman numeral three, prayer focused on eternal purpose. Uh, the first point there is the goal of eternal purpose prayer is to produce a mature corporate son and a worthy bride uh, for Christ. Um, and so look at Ephesians uh, 4, uh, 11. Uh, this is important verse of scripture. Uh, you know, Paul is talking about the fivefold ministry, and he says he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, here's what I want you to hear: to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And so, boy, that says a lot to pastors. What are, what's your goal? Uh, it's not to be the man of God of the hour and all, all of this. It's to equip the saints um, to, uh, to build a mature man. I will just tell, share one uh, story. The, the first time that I went to, I won't, I won't share the nation, but I went to an African nation. And... Uh, and so when I was there, I, the Lord gave me this passage to speak on. I'd never been there before, and I didn't know the people. I didn't know 
much of the, uh, the situation. Brian had met the, the contact, and so he knew him, and I didn't know him. So, But anyway, the first time I spoke, and I spoke on this Ephesians uh, chapter 4, and before I got up to speak, they, the host was uh, introducing all the dignitaries who were there that day, and it was apostle this, and a prophet this, and doctor this, and all, you know, all of that. And one of my points in the message was, that, you, you know, that the fivefold ministry is not to be the head and the, the visible. You're the foundation because you're building. What do you, you know, you're building and we're, who, who builds? Uh, the, the building is built upon the foundation. We're the foundation for building up the saints. And, of course, that went, did not go over well. That uh, thinned the crowd out. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty much, actually. Uh, none of those guys that had been introduced came back after that, which was fine. But I really think the Lord wanted to make a point there uh, that this, the fivefold is not to be exalted in itself. They are to build up the body of Christ according to God's eternal purpose to, to uh, build this mature man uh, in uh, the earth. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead, it's a little bit out of the order with the notes, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about the mature, uh, the mature man. The goal of this is to build up a mature man. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, talks about a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor, and pain in birth. And then it, it talks about the dragon. I won't, uh, I won't go into all that, the dragon, but uh, he was going to try to devour the child. And she gave birth to, verse 5, she gave birth to a son, a male child, or a man child in the King James, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Their child will caught up to uh, God in his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness. So anyway, the woman, um, who is probably the saints of all throughout history, but also in the present days, the church, out of the womb of the church is to become this mature man, this man-child. Uh, that is the purpose of that. Uh, and so you see that when this man-child comes into fullness, uh, there is uh, a transition uh, at the three-and-a-half-year mark of the tribulation period. Uh, and so we'll, we'll go into that in more detail in other places. But we see this is a goal of the uh, uh, of uh, eternal purpose prayer is to produce this corporate man. Uh, then you go a little bit later, uh, uh, Revelation uh, nineteen seven, and we won't turn to that. I won't read it. But the, when the bride is made ready, uh, the Lord returns. And so we see that the goal of these things is to produce, accomplish this a corp mature corporate man, and, uh, and for this to take place. The kingdom of God must be produced internally within a people in fullness. The kingdom of God must be produced within a people in fullness. Uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 20, Luke 17, 20, uh, says this. Jesus said, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees uh, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. The kingdom is within us. Now, some translations say is in your midst. And I think both are true uh, interpretations. To the Pharisees that day, the kingdom was in their midst. It wasn't in them. But to the, his followers who would eventually uh, have the Holy Spirit come, it would be within them. The kingdom is uh, within so it's an internal kingdom. It's an internal kingdom. And you see that in Paul's writings a lot too. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, you know, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Galatians 2, 20, no longer I live, but Christ who lives within me. And so this becomes part of the, uh, of the work of eternal purpose prayer uh, ministry is to pray for the internal kingdom to be formed in a people in fullness uh, so that uh, the corporate man can come forth and so that the bride can be made ready. Uh, and so this becomes the, the way that we pray in order to fulfill uh, 
uh, this goal of the eternal purpose prayer. I'm explaining it, eternal purpose prayer as well as the definition uh, of that. Uh, so prayer, uh, pray, Christ in a people in fullness is the, as the goal of eternal purpose prayer, eternal purpose, leads to prayer for this. It leads to us praying for this. Now, when I quoted from Revelation chapter 12, what you see was the woman crying out in labor to give birth to the man-child. Now, if you look at the, that in the King James, <coughs> it is the word travail. She's travailing in order to give to birth this man-child. Uh, you see it also in uh, Galatians 4.19. Paul says, you know, I labor till Christ is formed in you. The internal kingdom is formed in you. I, I labor until this takes place. Now, uh, the King James says, I travail until the Christ is formed in you, until that uh, uh, takes place. Uh, and so we see that for this internal kingdom of Christ within us in, in fullness, so that the, the man-child is made ready and, and comes forth, and the tribulation is initiated, and the bride is made ready, all these things that come forth that prayer, fervent. Now, I'm not saying you have to travail and go to the point where you're uh, just in tears and overcome and travail. I mean, that can be very powerful when it's God initiated, Holy Spirit initiated. But what I am saying is that there's, a, there's an urgent burden, a serious prayer that has to come forth for this internal kingdom and the corporate man and the bride made ready to come forth uh, in order uh, to see uh, th these things to be uh, accomplished. So that's prayer for the corporate man. But there's also, uh, again, we're just explaining eternal purpose prayer. There's also uh, prayer for the nations. Um, uh, if, you, if you, you know, Paul wrote about that in treaties for uh, petitions made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. You know, the, the, that scripture verse from 1 Timothy is there. Uh, but John wrote these words too, that worthy are, worthy are you to take the book and to break the seals, We're talking about Christ, for you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, every nation. Uh, and so... There is a need to pray for the nations. Remember, nations were the ethnos, which is people, uh, people with similar customs, geographic nations, uh, all of those things. Uh, so there is a need to pray for the nations. Um, I think there's a need to pray for the nation in which we live. You know, we li I live in America. We, I need to be, uh, I need to be pray for America. Now, uh, from a heavenly perspective, um, and hopefully I haven't skipped over that, but uh, yeah, I haven't yet. And from a heavenly perspective, I need to pray for America. We need to pray for Israel. You know, Israel is going to be the center of all the turbulence and the warfare uh, coming up in the in the age uh, at the end of the age, and so we need to pray for that. And then pray for the nations of the earth, other nations of the earth, as we are so uh, led uh, to pray right now. Um, you know, right as I'm speaking this, there's uh, the United States is pulled out of Afghanistan, and there's a huge turmoil uh, going on there, chaos going on in Afghanistan. Certainly, is a need to pray uh, for that, to pray for the Christians in Afghanistan, to pray uh, for God's will as it relates to that nation. You feel so burdened and so heavy-hearted uh, for the people there that are having to go through. Things, to the point that they're they're hanging on airplanes as they take off in a hope to get out and uh, and handing their babies over barbed wire fences to soldiers to help to hopefully get them out uh, of the of the nation. It's a it's a really uh, serious uh, issue. So we need to pray for the nations, and as we begin to pray for the nations, there uh, in issues like that, there is a there is a aspect of eternal purpose prayer.
where we're required to, rest- to pray into restraining and to resisting the work of the enemy who would hinder the coming forth of God's eternal purpose. Now, we have two sessions on different aspects of spiritual warfare and praying into, uh, into issues that would, we would need to resist in order to see the God's purposes uh, to come forth. Now, you know, some people would say we don't need to do that. Uh, and so if you don't feel you are to do that, that's fine. But I, we do. I believe that our church we do. And we, we pray into resisting as well as the coming forth. Co- resisting the enemy coming forth of the corporate uh, man. Uh, let, me, let me just read a little bit. You know, we see some of that in Ephesians chapter 6, the spiritual armor and all of that. But this is what uh, Terry Bennett, some of the things that Terry Bennett spoke on the same conference where the angel summoned us to the golden altar. Uh, he said this, he said, Can I be prophetic for a moment? Uh, God would move you, speaking directly to Restoration Life Church, that's our church, uh, into the establishment of an altar, a warrior's altar, so that the demonic power over Atlanta and others like it can be directly resisted in their operation and in their purpose by the offering of prayers upon an altar that is in accordance with the will of God for Atlanta. I want to stir up a warring spirit tonight. Take hold of the promises of God for the city. It has not gone too far. It can still be changed. It does not matter whether we win or not, but we will meet them in battle nonetheless. Carry the burden for the city. Is there a sufficiency to get a people out in Atlanta for a remnant to awake? Is there enough in the room tonight who realize that our purpose is greater than what we are experiencing but bringing the kingdom of God? Uh, And so he said that, and then a few other things. Let me just kind of read a couple of quotes. So I want to kind of establish this need to to war for the nations as part of an explanation of explaining eternal purpose prayer. Uh, This is, again, Terry Bennett quoted, quoting him. There is praying needed in this time that is a warrior's praying. All I'm saying is that God wants to establish men and women, young and old, who know how to pray but know how to pray very specific prayers. And then he said, uh, we must understand the hour we are living in and understand what God wants to do in our nation and in the nations. We can fight for God's original intent or we can live constantly praying for our own needs or we can, or we can fight for the will of God in our nation. Uh, here's another one. Prayer is not everything I want to say about this. Prayer comes down to me asking God for what our needs are. I am talking about a warring for God's purposes in the nation. Uh, what we were made, what were we made for? God does not want. What does God want? For such a time as this, we have been brought in for the kingdom, for the kingdom of God, for enforcing the victory of Christ right down on their heads through prayer, through intercession. Uh, a couple more. We must recognize we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against powers of darkness. The church has been called to deal with them through prayer. We must respond in war. There is peace on the other side of war. These beings must be subdued. And so the, the point I was going to make, I, I, you know, we, we've been, we talked about praying for the rise of the corporate man, for the bride to be made ready, for the overcoming sons to come forth, and that that would trigger the transition to the age to come. But there's a, there are forces that are coming against all this at the same time. And so we need to war uh, the eternal purpose house of prayer. I'm, again, I'm explaining uh, eternal purpose prayer. There is a d- dimension of that where we stand against and resist uh, these issues that would come against uh, the coming forth of this of God's purposes in our cities, in our nations, in Israel, and the nations uh, of the earth. So that's a, a part of the dynamic of an eternal purpose house of prayer. Uh, from that. Now, next point, prayer from a heavenly perspective. Remember, our definition was that eternal purpose prayer is prayer which focuses on the eternal purposes of God, excuse me, not on the needs or desires of man, and it originates from a heavenly perspective. Uh, We need, especially when we're praying uh, for the nations, we need to pray for a, from a heavenly 
perspective. You know, it's a lot, you, when you're, I mean, over the years I've done a lot of airplane uh, travel and I've flown a lot of miles and it's a lot of different look from 37,000 feet than it is on the ground. You get a different perspective. And so praying from a heavenly perspective at a lot of times can be uh, a lot different um, than praying from an earthly perspective. You know, you know when we, uh, I talked in the last session about our, uh, our journey of intercession, and we began to pray for America and, and different places, uh, but mainly America, uh, early on in our ministry, uh, early on. But we, a lot of what we prayed for was for our own comfort, our own pleasure, uh, for things to be worked out that gave us, that didn't disrupt our economy, that didn't create any kind of problems, where it didn't really have any effect upon people coming to the Lord or upon the corporate man coming forth or the bride being made ready. Uh, in fact, maybe had a negative effect on that. So we prayed for a lot of issues along those lines. Now, some of those were probably fine, but some of them probably were not. Uh, so we need to pray from a heavenly perspective. You know, we tend to want to pray for what will, will not disrupt our life. Uh, but when we pray from a heavenly perspective, we pray for what God wants to do. I mean, he may want to release judgment in America. He may want to release uh, judgment in the nations of the earth. He may want to release different things that, that go against our comfort zone, go against what we want. And so as, as an eternal purpose house of prayer, when we pray for the nations, we need to pray in agreement. Remember, I talked about this earlier. We need to, uh, we need to pray in agreement with Christ on, uh, on the throne as he stands ever living to make intercession. He's making intercession according to God's eternal purpose. And so we need to pray in agreement with those issues, which may or may not be for our own good. Now, we need to hear God's voice. We need to kind of get what he wants us to pray and then pray into agreement. And some of those kind of prayers are like, okay, I'm holding my nose and I'm going to pray because I don't really want to do it. I mean, there is that tendency with some of the things that we feel we need to, to pray. Because, you know, in, in, in America right now, I mean, a, abortion is rampant. The, just some of the uh, cultural issues are just going crazy right now. We're, if anything, we're, we're almost anything but a godly nation uh, in so many ways. Uh, we've, we're losing our moral authority in the earth. And I mean, just so many things uh, there. But we need to pray for God's kingdom over America in, a, in accordance with that heavenly perspective of what he wants for America. And this pertains to every nation. I know not everybody who will listen to this or watch this is for, lives in America. So you'll pray according to your own uh, issues that you face. But pray from a heavenly uh, perspective. Praying from a heavenly perspective is praying, uh, includes praying for the good pleasure of the Godhead. You know, it, um, we talked about this in the eternal purpose class, eternal blueprint, about Ephesians chapter one. It talks about for God's good pleasure, things for God's good pleasure. And God's good pleasure is to, is to have a bride for Christ and a corporate man, son for the father, to exalt the man Christ, for the nations to come into the kingdom. Well, that's God's good pleasure. Our good pleasure is comfort, provision, uh, healing. I mean, we, we want things for God, but a lot of times our pleasure uh, is things that are in opposition or not uh, connected to what God's good pleasure is. But praying from a heavenly perspective is praying from, from, for the good pleasure uh, of the Godhead. Uh, and so there's a lot in the notes there. I won't take the time uh, to, <coughs> to go through that. But there's more in the notes there. But, but again, we're praying from a heavenly uh, perspective. Um, uh, point three I've already talked about, about praying uh, perspective that God dictates for the nations from the viewpoint uh, of heaven. Okay, I'm just kind of looking to make sure I covered everything, and I think I did. Uh, so anyway, hopefully that you get the understanding, the explanation of God's eternal purpose. Now, let me just review it real quick. We need to pray into those five 
uh, issues, five aspects of eternal purpose. We need to have a spiritual environment. And then we need to pray uh, not for our own needs and wants and desires, but for God's plan and purposes. And we need to do it from a heavenly perspective, which includes prayer for the nations, includes spiritual warfare a lot of times for the nations, but it's praying for God's purposes, for his good pleasure, for his intent uh, to be fulfilled rather than ours. Uh, and so hopefully you got an overview with this first session and the, now the second session of what God's eternal purpose prayer is. Uh, and in the next session, we'll begin, the next four sessions, we will look at different uh, aspects, different themes. The next one, we'll look at the, at the corporate praying into the rise of the corporate man. Uh, then we'll go into a couple related to uh, resisting and spiritual warfare. And then the fourth one, we'll pray for Israel. So anyway, that's kind of where we're headed. Uh, I hope this has been helpful and, uh, and that you're beginning to get an understanding of what we're talking about as it relates to becoming a house of prayer, eternal purpose house of prayer, whether you're individual or a small group or a pastor of a church or building your own ministry there, uh, build it according to God's plan uh, is our prayer. Uh, and as forerunners that we participate in that as part of our forerunner call. So anyway, God bless you. Uh, thank you and uh, be blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen.